Good morning, USA, and welcome to another episode of the Bernie or Bus Show. We need to spill some tea today. My dilemma is that I have two ideas that I need to cover, so I think I'm going to do two shows today. So stay tuned for the other one. The other show that I'm going to do after this one is some uh, controversy swirling, but nobody knows about it unless they watch the Bernie or Bus show. Uh, so-called progressive journalist, uh, here's a leaked email for you. I was actually copied on this email. A, pro a so-called progressive journalist has a difference of opinion with the founder of Bernie or Bust, the founder of the Bernie or Bust movement. And so I'm going to share the details of that uh, leaked email with you on the other episode. But, but this episode, I'd like to do a little post debate uh, analysis, or at least share someone else's, and, and maybe chip in a little bit, and then follow up with a couple of issues from yesterday's show, because I received some pushback on a couple of the ideas that I presented, so I want to address that pushback. And I'm not talking about Aaron Maté as wonderful as his show is. Another idea that I'll just mention in passing is the gray zone. Um, they're talking about the Newsweek reporter who quit because his analysis in Syria did not fit the mainstream narrative. And so I, I just want to mention that in passing. You should go to the gray zone and watch Aaron Maté interview that uh, brave reporter. I, I watched that this morning. That, that has been very powerfully on my mind. There's so many things to talk about. So I'll just point you to that. Point, I'll point you to the gray zone. I'll even link to it. And then um, let's jump into some post-debate analysis here. Sanders, I do want to put the same question to you, Senator Sanders. What I message do you think? I answer that question, but I wanted to get back to... Okay, so the question she's asking is, is about um, the effect on people of color, our, our minorities. And he wanted to talk about climate change for a good reason, because of its effect on people of color disproportionately and there was a kind of a gotcha moment here that that happened and then he talked his way back out of it I think the issue of climate change for a moment because I do believe this is the existential issue senator with all respect this question is about race can you answer the question as it was asked I in fact, are going to be the people suffering most if we do not deal with climate change. They should have clapped there. Right, there yes. All right. There is a very specific reason why we played that particular yes. video, which is that we have Rihanna Joy Gray, Bernie Sanders, National Se here. Press Secretary, here yes. to respond. I saw your tweets. Um, while that was all unfolding, just right. react to that moment. There was a question that had been asked of another candidate about race. Comes to Bernie Sanders. He says, can I talk about climate change? Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you answer the yeah, question? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people who have a lot of ink to spill about intersectionality, who seem not to really understand what the concept is all about. Bernie Sanders started his answer about climate change because climate change disproportionately affects black and brown people. And for too long, we have divvied up all of these issues in their little buckets. And that's part of why we haven't able, been able to solve them comprehensively. So there were a lot of people who were quick to clap and thinking that that was a dunk moment. But what ended up happening was that Bernie Sanders ended up showing that they were more interested in a kind of a viral gotcha moment than substantively listening to how you need to deal with multiple issues at the same time, intersecting issues to really help the communities that they say they claim they, they claim to care so much about. Yeah, I mean, we, I already, I knew it was. This is identity politics. People want to narrow the questions down and speak to particular issues when Bernie is right that dealing with climate change and dealing with the economy, dealing with economic justice, will solve pretty much all of the issues. It's going to be immediately seized upon, and I saw, I saw it being discussed. Do you, do, why do you, where do you think the impulse for that gotcha came from? What did you think? I mean, look, there, there is a critique of Bernie Sanders that says when you talk about economics so much, when you foregone economics, it must be necessarily at the expense of other issues, particularly issues that disproportionately affect black and brown people that are often historically 
waylaid in, in the effort to appeal to a kind of a mass or a, a larger mass. But what's so interesting about the Bernie Sanders campaign and this approach is to say when you actually are talking about class and when you're using class as one of the many intersections that should make up intersectionality, when you don't treat intersectionality as kind of like oppression Olympics and you actually understand that the, with the Columbia River Collective. Oppression Olympics. That's what politics have become, a oppression Olympics. Who has been disadvantaged the most? And while those topics are all important, intersectionality addresses them. We're not sweeping them under the carpet. We're, we're saying how they're all interrelated. That's why Bernie's message is so, for some people, just so relentlessly um, repetitive. But that's where inter intersectionality comes in. We don't need an oppression Olympics. We need to solve the root problems, and then all the, the other issues will be addressed. Women who actually invented the term SMIT is that different, um, any, any one person is going to be affected in many different ways. So black people are affected by environmental concerns. Obviously, there are black women, black men, black trans people, and that runs the gamut. And so people need to be open to the idea of an economic message because if, when you are able to tie economics into these broader um, subsections, you're able to win and have a populist message without throwing those historically marginalized groups under the bus or making white people feel like they are, in fact, marginalized. Now. Well, and it's a bizarre thing to say your identity is over here and your life is over there. Yeah. Right. Those things are obviously all mixed up together. Right. I want to ask you, though. So good. The other uh, part of the debate analysis that I'll mention in passing is that Mayor Pete got some some pushback. He, he Bernie Sanders made fun of him. I would show you that one, except I bet you've already seen it where where he is. Uh, chiding Biden and Buttigieg for their billionaire donors. So if, you know, it, you can watch that yourself. I'm sure everybody who, who is talking about the debate is going to talk about that. But I wanted to focus in specifically on the intersectionality idea. Now, another idea is that, that I got some pushback on is impeachment. I uh, yesterday's show was that impeachment is a shiny object. And I said that we we are just being distracted from the main issues. Bernie has, he's said, well, yeah, we need to impeach Donald Trump, but let's not lose focus on the issues. But Tulsi went even farther. And I think that her position is correct, actually. And a lot of progressives don't don't like the idea that we shouldn't be just losing our shit over impeachment I, I i'll speak a little bit on this you know i'll let tulsi speak for herself because she's on the show but i just want to say that when when we try to get rid of a standing president who was duly elected for exposing corruption in the democratic party we're barking up the wrong tree that's why my, my uh, take on it Centrists are using impeachment to cast the Trump years as a regrettable detour in American history, one that is soundly rebuked by Washington professionals who uphold a Cold War consensus that will again become the norm after he's out of office. Absent in so the people who are screaming their heads off about impeachment want us to go back to the good old days of a Cold War mentality. She's, she's talking quickly, and in, in this part of her... The, the format of the show is they have these checklists and they talk quickly from a script, and then they unpack what they've said afterwards, which it's a really good format. But sometimes when they're speaking so quickly, you might lose some of the brilliance of it. What she just said was really brilliant. Let me go back just a, a hair so you can hear it again. Centrists are using impeachment to cast the Trump years as a regrettable detour in American history. Centrists are using impeachment to cast the Trump presidency as a regrettable detour as opposed to looking at the last 60 or 70 years as an atrocity from both Democrats and Republicans. One that is soundly rebuked by Washington professionals who uphold a Cold War consensus that will again become the norm after he's out of office. Right. Absent in the centrist impeachment is any acknowledgement of the systemic dangers Trump's racism and corruption pose to American democracy or the complicity of large swaths of the GOP in his regime. So they're impeaching him for the wrong things. 
Like the funerals of John McCain and George H.W. Bush, impeachment has a largely theatrical function. It's a way of upholding the values of the ancien regime, a foreign policy consensus currently under threat, and preparing the ground for a return to normality restoration after the vulgar demagogue is out of office. Right. The way the presidential candidates have approached impeachment has actually been pretty telling. In particular, there's been a stark difference in the approach of Senators Sanders and Warren. To be sure, both support impeachment. But Warren jumped in headfirst, full hashtag resistance style. And Sanders gets off the topic as quickly as he can, making clear that Democrats must stay focused on the issues voters actually care about, like health care, climate, and student debt. But of all the candidates, Tulsi Gabbard has taken the most unorthodox approach. Soon after the initial transcript of that call between Trump and the Ukrainian president was released, we had a chance to speak with the congresswoman. Here's what she had to say. You know, I think when you step outside of the bubble here in Washington and, and you get to where most folks in the country are, uh, look, I'm not a lawyer, but I think most people reading through that transcript are not going to find that uh, extremely compelling cause to throw out a president that won an election in 2016. And instead, what I think most people will see is, hey, this is uh, another move by Democrats uh, to get rid of Donald Trump. Right. Okay. So the rest of the show is good and you should watch it. But that was the main point for me was that impeachment is a shiny object. Now here... We've got a little bit of a trashing of booty judge, which I'm always in favor of. And and again, here is a clip that you should go back and watch in its entirety. One of the points I made yesterday is that Jeremy Corbyn, his loss is not because he was too far left, but because of Brexit. And this is a little bit of a um, justification for my argument. And more. This this clip is really varied. There are a lot of really interesting things on it. And that's what I'm kind of trying to avoid um, by doing my leaked email expose in the same one. I don't want to have too many, too many threads of conversation. But I'm tying up loose threads from yesterday here with this. It, in terms of what it means in the U.S., they want to say the show's Bernie Sanders will lose. But in fact, this, it seems quite likely Corbyn lost because he didn't continually stand strong, at least on the Brexit issue, on a lot of other issues, yes. But uh, whereas if you actually stand strong on your left-wing stances, then... Yeah. No, absolutely. And when you look, like, let's think about the 2016 Democratic primaries. Bernie was like, oh, crazy Bernie saying all these crazy things. Like, you know, let's have Medicare uh, for everyone. Let's have health care for everyone. Let's have free school for everyone. These crazy ideas. Those are pretty bizarre. They're things. so bizarre, so bizarre. obviously. Yeah. And also, those are the ideas that the 20, uh, 20 Democratic primary has started out with. That's what everyone is saying in the Democratic primary, right? Or some variant on that. Like, right. those are being debated on the main stage. So right. clearly the, people think those are good ideas. The, the war of ideas has, in a certain sense, been won for the Democratic Party in that those that's what everyone's talking about. I mean, yeah. granted, Buttigieg and them are now trying to pour, fight those back like it's a, <laughs> like it's some, a sword fight. Like, but. Well, you know, Buttigieg did work for McKinsey, this uh, very corporate firm, this huge firm that goes in and essentially slashes up companies and gets people fired um so sure yeah, i mean he, he worked, literally worked blue for Cross, an, Bruce, exactly. blue shield when they fired like thousands of employees he was the consultant on mckinsey for blue cross blue shield right before they laid off a ton of people like yeah i wonder why he's not for medicare for all he's and evil. he's also the, and also his some of his military work is very suspicious he's like flying across the world for one day and stuff CIA yeah i really enjoyed the coverage that was like these are uh, this harmless list of clients that he had oh it's an insurance company that's probably fine <laughs> department of defense yeah i don't know what that's about it doesn't don't worry about it but right i mean he's holed up in iraq and afghanistan it they're what they're not saying is that pete probably is working for the cia in these quote-unquote secret rooms and we still don't really know what happened so in terms of what the you know the polls that the corporate media continues to force down our throats they show that like uh biden's still winning in a lot of states or bernie sanders is two or three voodoo judge is winning in some states should we really care about those polls do they mean anything <laughs> do they like i don't know do you have any insight into what's going to happen? Will this primary be stolen from Bernie again? Uh, great questions. Um, who is to say on these polls, man? I mean, 2016, the polls obviously lied to us, but they are the information we have. Um, but I just, you know, even still with these polls that we do have, we're seeing headlines like this one has been my favorite, I think, so far. Although the one you said from The Onion was pretty good, too, which we'll get to. But uh, I think my favorite one so far has been 
Um, Buttigieg is fourth, but a strong fourth. That's the headline. <laughs> and Bernie Sanders is in the lead on the poll they're talking about. It used about. to be. Because we can't say. Well, there's no way we could say right, Bernie Sanders mention. is first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, my favorite when they have them listed there on screen, but they won't say the name. What's the one from The Onion that I, you told me about? I forget uh, it what it was, is, but it, it's like it Bernie was, Sanders. Bernie Sanders plunges two points up or something like that, <laughs> right, you know, to, to paraphrase. Yes. Thank you, mainstream media. But that, but that is, the, yeah, the mainstream media is still, still working very hard to try and undermine Bernie Sanders, as was the same with Corbyn in the, in the UK. They were just trashing him endlessly. Oh, yeah. I mean, there were these ridiculous claims that he was anti-Semitic. These are claims based on the fact that he is anti-Zionist, which is incredibly different, right? The fact that he doesn't believe... That's a good point, that this show should definitely keep um, alive, keep up so you can see it. Anti-Zionist is not the same as anti-Semitic, and we need to remember that going forward, because I think that issue is going to heat up if Bernie does get the nomination that Israel should have free reign to just like go and slaughter Palestinian citizens who are, you know, that are living in land that Israel has completely taken from them. That means right. he's anti-Semitic. Right. Like that's, those two things don't really equate in my mind. And apparently as a Jew who criticizes Israel, I am anti-Semitic. You're also anti-Semitic. And, and so is Bernie Sanders. They're now, they're now throwing that one around. So someone let you know yeah. that you're anti-Semitic. They told you about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The official, the official uh, people that decide those things. They came, came down and, and said, came and let me know. Lee Camp, anti-Semitic. Uh, speaking of Israel, I haven't talked much about this, but they have, uh, they're have they planning on another election. This will be their third election because... They so they're embroiled in... So we've got Netanyahu is um, convicted of, of taking bribes or something. He, he's corrupt as fuck. And so they're trying to... People, people criticizing a right-winger like Netanyahu are anti-Semitic, I guess. And, and that's, that's a point that we'll come back to. But again, another thread that I'll have to tie up, it looks like. So, so those are my threads. I just wanted to, to see if I could do some justice to the people that argue with me about these topics and, and say, look, I've got solid backing for my crazy ideas. So now stay tuned, Go, uh, come back maybe in an hour or so, and I'll have the other one with the leaked emails and keep on burning. Get on board the Bernie Buzz train. Come get on board the Bernie Buzz train. Once you hear that clickety clack, there ain't no time for turning back. Come get on board.